the kind of loyalty that ICO has engendered is quite amazing. There are five of us here who were part of the original group that Patrick led as ICO leaders. And it's a tribute to his sense of connectedness, to his sense of helping people be connected to each other. And we're going to have one more early um, ICO leader, Susan. There she is. She'll be here in just a moment. Is Danny here? Danny Goldberg? I haven't seen him, but. Well, I don't feel very deserving to actually speak here today. So I fell out of touch with Patrick um, for a long time. But I met him in 1969, and um, we were rampaging mountains, and Peter Perkins was part of that at some point wrapping into. But my first my first time with Len, uh, with Len Bammons and and Patrick out on our snowshoes out in the out in the wilds in the winter in the snow at about 2.30 a.m., looking at how that moon was either moving too slow or too fast along the pines. And Patrick was always using this language that kind of, I mean, I was 17, I think he was 31, and he had this language that was just sort of amazing. And I, I just thought that moon was going to start dropping out of the sky. And so the stuff I heard, I was a little Palo Alto girl. And he'd always say things like, hey, matey, how many buttons on them, them uh, Navy trousers there. I was wearing these felt, you know, little felt things. I didn't know how to dress back then for climbing. And um, after we got back, we had a celebration up in Berkeley, and he started talking about all these other kind of side trips we might be doing and stuff. So there was, there was this, um, at some point, we got together with Peter, and it may have been Jack. I can't remember how this thing came together, but it was before the ICO. I mean, there wasn't any name for it. We were going to get together with some kids. I've been working with kids all my life and continue to. And we were going to get these kids, and we were going to go into, into the inner city kind of and get, like, the Indian Center. Yeah, let's get down to Mission Street and get, get into the American Indian Center. And we proposed, we did some kind of slide project or something, and we got vans, and we took those kids out down into the Big Sur area. And then we came back, and we wanted to do a Hunter's Point group, as I remember. So it was sort of like a pilot project or something. So we got this Hunter's Point group, and we get down into the deep woods, and they're going nuts because they've never been in the outdoors. And Patrick said, that's okay, they're, they're going to, oh, we're going to blow their minds. Hey, Major, we're going to just blow their minds. Can you imagine? What Tell them to keep the cherry bombs at home, though. So, <laughs> so we, I was a vegetarian at that point. We're carrying in the meat, and um, Patrick said that he'd carry the meat because I, I didn't want anything to do with the meat. But I'm just waiting for that salad to be made. And we're trudging in for several miles, and these kids are bringing in all the food, and I'm making sure that the vegetables and that, that salad makings is in good shape. And we get in there, and Patrick said, well, Susan, why don't, you, why don't you get these guys helping on that salad? So I did. There's a great big tall dude. He was about a year or two younger than me, I think, at the time. Great big guy. And he's one of the trip kids. And he's been kind of lurking along the sides all the time. And he came and volunteered to break up the salad, and afterwards, he said he'd put the dressing on it. He flipped down his fly and just sprayed all over my, uh, all over the salad. And I was about to jump out of my skin, and I, I didn't know it happened too fast. I took that bowl and put it right on the guy's head. I had to reach way up. And Patrick, gentleman that he is, comes along. And he goes, hey, matey, just simmer it down. Just, just simmer it down. Just lie it down. It's going to be all right. He was such a gentleman at every point that the contrast between his language and his actions was such a divine gift. And I never put it together until I became much older. And so he, I went off to Washington for a year in Alaska, and this was in the 70s, so I sort of lost track. He gave me a call in the mid-90s. And again, I didn't come through. I just, he was such a prince in how he, he would ask questions and then just hold. But he used to tell me when I was young, I was very critical and pretty judgmental, and I shouldn't be burning my bridges behind me. Don't be burning the bridges behind me. Don't be burning the bridges. So I had the gift of a call from Berkeley that he was, he was very ill this year. And when I heard it, I contacted the family, and they allowed me to come. And so I was able to talk with him a couple times 
um, two days before his death, the third and fourth day before his death, and he recognized me. And um, I said, Patrick, I feel so badly that I, I didn't stay in touch. And you used to say, don't be burning the bridges behind you, Maisie. Don't be burning the bridges. And he looked at me, and he had that twinkle, and he said, and then his head turned to the side, and he looked sort of down, and he said, and from the other side. And so I thought he meant the other side of the bed, because over there was Esther, that lovely lady, and his daughters. But later, I had to put together, I'm just hoping that he's going to do the grand stuff of contact. One last story I want to tell about what a prince he is, though, of manners and gentlemanliness, is how actually the very first year we were on a trip, he had a push-button dashboard, Dodge, Chrysler, Pontiac, something early 60s, and he pushed the button for the gear, and we're way over on the eastern side, down near Whitney Portal, and about five of us coming out of the hills late at night, and we get in that car, and we're going to drive all the way over and come back to Palo Alto. So he decided, I was youngest, most energetic, he put me in the driver's seat, and he reached over and pushed the gear, and I just drove. I drove as fast as I could, about 70 miles an hour, everybody's crashed in the back, Patrick's over to the side. Whenever he'd come to, he'd always make these remarks about... Um, I was doing just fine, just fine. And I came up over Tioga and down into Merced to a gas station at like 4.30 in the morning. And it ground to a halt. This car just started steaming and it just kind of stopped and I couldn't reverse it back to the pump. And back in those days there was a man in the station 24 hours ago. And he came out and I said, I can't move my car. And he lifts the hood and he goes, oh ma'am, you um, looks like the engine's welded together here. <laughs> and Patrick gets up and he comes around and goes, hey, Maitie, it's okay, it's going to be okay. And he looks at the dash, it's in second gear. <laughs> and I said, oh, my God, Patrick. No, that's okay, Maitie. All we need to do is figure out how to get a bus and get you back. I was going to college at the time. Get you back for your classes on time. <laughs> that was it. Ever after, there was never a mention of the car, and I don't think I ever came up with the replacement, so I owe him big. <laughs> I thank you for the chance, and I would, I would love to um, have everyone just think of him making connection again with bridges between. <laughs>